Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Counterpoise Podcast. My name is Malik Foster. I'm one of your co-hosts today. Hey, hey everybody. I'm Samantha Adams. I'm one of your other co-hosts. And I am Ever Stevenson, one of your third co-hosts. And today, we want to thank you guys all for checking in, catching us on the Counterpoise Podcast. And we have a good show for you um, on deck today. Um, one of the shows, before we get into the topic, though, we want to go ahead and show our Black Business of the Week. So you guys just give me one second here as I pull this information up here momentarily. Just one second. Yeah. Um, so this week's Black Business of the Week that we were promoting is Black Men's Wear, um, their website here and also um, have a YouTube channel and basically, I'm going to go to their Instagram page as well, so you guys can check them out. Um, this is just a group that's kind of promoting imagery of black men, and they have events that take place in all over the world, pardon me, all over the world. Um, as you see, they do flash mobs in LA, DC, Dallas, um, Tampa, they've done London, um, Chicago, and other events as well. Just recently, they did Miami. And here you are, just some pictures and some imagery of uh, some of the different events that they've had and some of the fellas that they come through. It's a great time for people to come, network, uh, whether you're in the fashion industry, whether you're just a young brother that just likes to get dressed up, look nice, um, whether you have you know anything in tailoring, alteration, things of that nature. Um, it's a way for people to kind of get together, black men to get together and network. Um, promote what they do in that local area. Uh, also resources for you to kind of come in where you can connect with other like-minded individuals whenever you travel to those different locations. Um, you can meet up with people who you know share some of the same interests as you. Um, and so that was an event that recently took place here in Miami. Um, and also one that goes around the world as well as the nation. Um, putting on events and things we wanted to highlight though, those brothers and um, go ahead and salute salute that company. Um, now, for today's topic, uh, we have a really good topic today, uh, one in which we're looking at finding solutions to the Black community, or is there a Black community, basically. Um, what we're looking at in today's, in today's discussion is the conversation of what is a Black community, um, exactly what that would consist of and how that could help um, the Black Americans, um, excuse me, Black Americans from the diaspora. So before we jump into this, I'm going to share another video with you guys here momentarily. And this video is one with Dr. Claude Anderson, who's an economist, as well as um, an individual who has worked within looking at American, the disparity of poverty within money, as well as uh, trying to unify and rectify that situation. So here is a video from Mr. Anderson. If we will just pull up. Just one second. This group economics, why? Because they don't have communities. Integration destroyed their communities. Now, when I go across America, I go to every city, and it, I cannot find not one single black community in America. All you got in America are black neighborhoods. A black neighborhood is totally, absolutely useless. A black neighborhood is where you eat and sleep. There's not one black community in America. To have a black community, you must qualify with three things you must have. You must have a wholly independent economic structure. You must have a code of conduct. You must have people in elected office to represent you. They have to be qualified as a community. I go across America, I can't find one. I get into California, I can find Chinatown, Japan town, little Cambodia, little Saigon, Korea towns, little Mexican towns. I can find little Havana, High Lear, Cork town, Cork towns, little Italy, little Italian, okay, Greek town. But I can't find a black town any place in the country. If you don't have, if you don't have a, a community, you can't play the game. You cannot practice monopoly in this town unless you all. They can't practice group economics. So, um. In particular, one of the things that Mr. Claude Anderson was discuss Dr. Claude Anderson was discussing in that in that statement was about again group economics. And in referencing that, 
Um, he was referring to how there that occurs within more than just the economy of um, actual money. It also has the um, political side where you have also, excuse me, legislators and individuals who are representative of your voice and of your community. Um, you also have businesses within those communities as well as representative of those individuals within that community. Um, and he touched on a couple other things and I, I don't want to you know, hog up on this conversation. So if you guys want to just jump in, y'all can. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think um, Claude, Dr. Claude Anderson hit the nail on the head right there. Um, you know, integration did uh, disrupt the communities because before then you saw definitely, um, you know, uh, black neighborhoods, black communities that were doing prosperous, you know, Tulsa community, communities in North Carolina, uh, communities, uh, Florida, and throughout the country, um, you had these black enclaves of people actually prospering. Nowadays, it's just neighborhoods or isolated areas where the average income is a certain level, but they don't have a independent economic structure, as he was saying, or any type of code of conduct. It's just, hey, these group of black people just live here because that's the way the lines have been drawn out. And there's, and there's also possibly no black political representation as well in those areas a lot of the times, right? So um, I think he, had, he made valid points and I agree with what he was saying um, personally. Just my uh, thoughts on the video, Sam. So um, I think what he said was very important. You know, there are plenty of black neighborhoods. You can go to many cities in the country and you can find a predominantly black neighborhood. But if you go to the corner store, it's not typically black owned, right? Or if you go to the gas station, it's not typically black owned. If you go to the hair store, not black owned. Like there's not a lot of black owned businesses in those neighborhoods, right? And to kind of piggyback off of something Malik said, like back <clears throat> when you think about Tul Tulsa, for example, Tulsa was, an had, was having its own economic boom. Um, one of the things that Dr. Claude Anderson said that he believed that, well, he stated that uh, integration affected, had a negative impact on Black community. I think that there are other things that also contributed to the demise of the Black community, right? Like you talk about um, systemic racism, oppression, not being able to get loans, bank loans for businesses, and um, having a hard time getting equal pay, things like that. Um, things that we've talked about on many other past podcast. So, you know, if you want more information about that, about our opinions or our thoughts, please feel free to go check those out on our YouTube page. Um, but as it relates to this, you know, um, one of the things that I think also plays a factor is fear. Um, fear amongst Black people to, to, to build, build up that community, right? Um, fear can be paralyzing. And the reason why I say fear is because when you look at <clears throat> somebody who wants to build a business or somebody who wants to grow economically in, in any particular way, when there's fear, there's fear of failure, fear of not being able to get the money, fear of not being able to have the, the customers, there's those kinds of fears. But also I think that there may have been at least in the past, it may not necessarily be the, the case today, but at least sometime in our past, a fear of destroying what we create, right? If you look at what happened in Tulsa, those people were out there minding their business, flourishing, living their life, you know, doing well. And then racism kind of reared its ugly head, didn't kind of, it reared its ugly head and went in there and, and, and messed everything up for, the, for them. You know what I mean? And so I believe that in the, in the next few years following the massacre, there were others, you know, that there were so many other times where there were communities of black people that were thr thriving and flourishing. And it's a race from history books, you know what I mean? Um, but um, racism and discrimination and, and hate for melanated people caused the demise of those things. Um, but not only that, you know, when you also look at the Jim, the Jim Crow era specifically, because that's when there was a lot of organizations that popped up. There were definitely other organizations that have been created throughout the time, like uh, 
you know, Greek organizations that are predominantly um, Black and things like that. But when you talk about other organizations, which include um, things like the NAACP and things like that, you know, a lot of times the fight that they, they, that they have is um, for just rights, but it's not really a fight for anything else. You know what I'm saying? You don't really see the NAACP giving money towards a Black business. You might see the United Negro College Fund funding HBCUs and things like that, but you don't see a whole lot of these organizations promoting community because they're too busy fighting for equality. Yeah, I think a lot of the Black organizations that we have, um, they, they, they support, they want to do too much of a broad and ambiguous support, right? So like when it's time to support Black businesses and stuff like that, they want to include every body right they want to include minorities uh you know uh uh lgbtq community they want to include too many groups um but when those groups want something done they don't include black people like oh well let, let's get this passed but we also want to help out black people too like when the asians had their little uh when they had their um uh their, their crime bill when the asians had their crime bill um the asian hate bill right uh, it's not like they would say, well, let's include Black people. They've gone through this as well. So um, other groups exclude us when they want their benefits. But when we, we're trying to get uh, funding and benefits, it's like, okay, federal government, uh, you know, Blacks and minorities or underserved communities. And it's like, we're, we're, we're all of those things, but there's other people that are classified as those things as well. If they use uh, Blacks or descendants of American slaves, or they were more specific in the language and had us as a protected class that would uh, better uh, be of use to the community because these organizations, they'll, they'll hand this money to these institutions and everybody gets a cut of the pie. And when it's under this organization control and they have that broad language to use, it, when it's at their discretion, I feel, I, I feel as though black people don't benefit as much as they should. Uh, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but um, hold on. I don't. Let me jump in here real quick, Sam. I was gonna, I was gonna push back on that just a tad, just because um, I feel like you know that that's not necessarily a fair assessment that I would take from the black community, excuse me, black organizations, because I do have, I have seen um, from my personal experience, organizations who have either committed to doing things like you know having little sporting events, also having scholarships and things like that. Um, to help now granny like you said as far as helping um a business I, I i do think that that's not necessarily anything that i've seen be done on on a grand scale um and it, and it could be just my not my understanding of the knowledge of, of, of some of the big works that's been done by some organizations yeah I, i'm talking about like federal funding though Edward, yeah, Edward, and, that's, what else. that's where i was going to go with too i think because when you were making that statement it kind of seemed like you were more so relying, referring to federal funds as opposed to, like you said, regular organizations. And I think they look to saying stuff like, well, you know, we have the SBA. And I know that's another one of the things that we're going to talk to talk about in a little bit, where the government looks to try to make it seem as though, hey, here's where our attempts to make funds for, you know, minority businesses kind of go. Or um, And granted, that's a statement, but to the point that you made, it's not as directed towards right. the individuals that need the most the most the most work and um and that's one of the things that i think that we really had to go to but i also think that again i wanted to speak to something as well when we talk about organizations and in themselves right because there's a lot of individuals who um with any within anything in this world right a lot of people just look at certain things and they get power and they just want it just to have power and we see these things happen in the churches we see these things happening like we said and community organizations we see it happen on the jobs day to day where you see individuals kind of take assume roles just to have influence on others and that, and that influence isn't something that's really needed for the collective as much as it is for them to be seen and I think a lot of times that's something that we have to kind of move away from too, is people kind of just being joining organizations or just being around and not actively doing something to help the other individuals who 
aren't able to be a part of those communities and those organizations. And, and I just want to say this, I got you, Sam. I just want to say this too, because I feel like it's almost a disservice because it's like sometimes some of these organizations may be speaking to other individuals who they feel like they can benefit, which might be people who are well situated like themselves, um, as opposed to the, the people who need the most work on the ground levels, you know, like with um, to the point I'm, I'm assuming you may be making, like when we look at other organizations' histories and you have social programs like, you know, um, the Black Panthers, I know Sam will go into a little more detail about that as well, but how they have programs that kind of help work with, you know, the day-to-day -day community, you know what I'm saying, with the after-school programs or, excuse me, the, uh, feeding kids before they go to school and things of that nature, well, that, that reach the, the average citizen. And I think a lot of times we don't necessarily have orgs that look for the collective as much as it does just for the benefit of those individuals, whether it's just college bound, you know what I'm saying, educated, you know, um, Black Americans versus just the day to day, you know, uh, individual. Just everybody. And how they're being pushed out of the system. Right. right. And that that's the point that I was actually getting ready to make, um, you know, I agree with, with what you're saying, Malik, as it relates to um, making it geared specifically to Black people, period, right? Doesn't mean that Black people are not a protected class. We are a protected class, but we, we are protected as minorities and not as Black people. And I think it's important to make that distinction. But then when you start, when, when you talk about the only place I really have to give a little pushback on is with the LGBTQ community. The reason why I have to give a little pushback is because you have individuals who are black who are members of that community. So they would they stand to benefit um, from the the stride the strides that are made within that community, just like they stand to benefit with the strides that are made within the black community. So I think um, them di they're they're different, right? Because their 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 community is a, a makeup of so many different people. Right, you have people from all over the place who are members of the LGBTQ community, whereas with Black people, it's literally people who are descendants from Africa. Period. You see what I'm saying? Or African, African, the enslaved Africans that were brought to this country. Period. However, you want to slice it and dice it, it's different when you're talking about um, sexual preference over um, gender. I mean, not gender, um, nationality or um, race. You see what I'm saying? Um, and so I just, that, that's the only pushback I really had, but I do agree with you that, you know, when you're talking about, with the both of you, when you're talking about organizations specifically, um, and that's kind of, like I said before, that's the point that I was getting at. It's that a lot of these organizations, they, they do things either to fight for justice or they do things for um, socially. And, they, and it's to help black people, but it's not, it's to help groups of black people. It's not to help all black people. And that right there is, is what I mean as far as getting that type of support. Now, one of the things we do here at the Counterpoise Podcast, if you've noticed, every week we try to highlight a black business. We don't gain anything from that, right? Except the fact that we're trying to help flourish another business economically, one way or another. If two people go there, that's two people that weren't going to go before. You know what I'm saying? However, we can help because if everybody does a little, nobody has to do a whole lot. And that's the thing about community and contribution. Everybody contributes regardless of what you're going to gain and what you're not going to gain, right? Um, and that leads into that whole crabs in a barrel syndrome, right? Um, the other day I was watching, I was on Instagram and I saw Gilly the King on there. Now, a lot of you guys may or may not know who Gilly is. Gilly uh, used to be, he's from Philadelphia, he used to be a rapper. Um, well, he, he still kind of raps his son, his son's rap. Um, and Gilly, Gilly's a very respected person in the rap community. You see what I'm saying? People go to him for advice, things like that. Sometimes he can be brash. He can be very brash sometimes. Some people don't necessarily agree with everything that he has to say. Sometimes he has a lot of good things to say. And one of the things that he said the other day, oh, he also has his own podcast, him and his cousin Wallow. Um, it's called Million Dollars Worth of Game. Uh, but he was on there giving his advice and he was talking about, especially as Black people, because I've even heard Jay-Z say something to the effect, and I've witnessed it myself, where you have somebody who's in a place where they're getting ready to take off, but they need this one ingredient. They need this one connect. 
they need this one help, they need assistance in one area. And, and, and another person has that connect or has that, has access to that assistance, but they don't give it to them. They don't give it to them. And then what ends up happening is either A, that person's dream or um, business or whatever may either A, fail, or it may take a thousand times longer to get there because they're trying to get this connect or all kinds of things happen. But you could have just shared it. Like there's no, there's nothing wrong with trying to help somebody get to the next level, right? And a lot of times us as black folks, we hold on to that kind of stuff. We hoard it because we're not trying to see the next person fl flourish. Now, um, one of the other things I also wanted to touch on really quickly as it relates to Dr. Claude Anderson's um, speech. First of all, Dr. Claude Anderson is also um, an author. He wrote Black Labor, White Wealth. I recommend it. Everybody read it. It's a good book because um, it gives a lot of information. Um, but when he talked about the three things that you need for, for a community, and when he gave those things, it wasn't specifically about Black people, just for a community. He said you need economic structure, code of conduct, and elected officials. There are plenty of Black elected officials, even in Black communities, especially out here in Atlanta, right? But the problem is there's no code of conduct and there's no economic structure. You have a bunch of people, especially today, right now, where people are becoming more conscientious about the about economics and investments and building Black wealth and family and generational wealth for the Black, for black families and things like that, which is a beautiful thing. Problem is there's no structure. How is it that we're feeding back into the community and continuing to grow ourselves up um, and out of the space that we've been in for hundreds of years? When you look at the Asian community, the um, Middle Eastern community, when you look at the Jewish community, they all build, they all assist each other. They support their own businesses. They build those businesses within their own neighborhoods and they continue to put in and pour in. And so when they pour into those businesses, it makes it easier for those um, businesses to pour out back into the community. And we don't have that amongst black people. We just have a bunch of black folks living in the area. You know, and then, like I said, we might support this black business over there. Most of them are online. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of that. And, and this should definitely be a code because that crabs in a barrel syndrome shows that there is no code. Because if there was no, if there was a code, there would be that, 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 that crabs in a barrel thing would not be a factor. Um, I, I just wanted I to make sure I, I touched on that. Um, and, and to your point, I think that's one of the saddest things. And, 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 and it's almost like it goes into the circle, right? Because we don't have that economic structure. People become crabs in a barrel, right? And then there is no hold of ethics to try to, you know, one, create the economic structure as well as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as prevent, you know what I'm saying, individuals from, from, from doing that, right? Because I feel like if we all knew that that, that there's really something for you out here and then you don't have to try to rob nobody, steal from nobody to actually make your way that you can find a way out here and you will flourish if you're in your lane and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you answering your calling, then you will realize that there's no reason for you to try to block somebody else's blessing. But I think a lot of times people feel like, oh, well, part of me continuously to thrive is to hoard others. You know what I'm saying? And, um, I, I get it. Like you said, when you're in business, you know, you know, that's just part of capitalism, right? You know, there can only be one, right? But at the same time, I think you can learn that it's how you do things sometimes. And I think that goes again to the code of ethics. You feel what I mean? I think if you have a certain code, you realize there's a way about going and while getting the things that you're supposed to get. And if you do it a certain type of way, you'll be rewarded with either one longevity in that thing. You feel me? And then two, you know, you'll also be able to one, just see some success um, within your own life, within, within your business, within whatever it is that you're doing. So I think, you know, us being able to see like that crab in a barrel mentality it, it is really one that I, that I think is like, man, like you said, it goes back to just the initial times when which we always just seem like, you know, and a lot of times for, for some people, the only way that they can feel empowered is to, to make others feel smaller, right? To make others feel in place because now they feel like they have their place. But I think you, when you really take the time to look at that, you realize you're not really having any power. And if all the power that you have is just trying to hold your people down, you're really limiting yourself to being able to 
flourish like it should be. But again, some people don't have a mindset of community. They only have a mindset of individualism. And that's the reason why a lot of times we see people kind of go and just do what they feel like they need to do best for them, which don't get me wrong, I'm never telling nobody, oh, do what you do what's right for the community. You know what I mean? Because you need to do what you need to do for yourself in order to be able to help the community. To mm-hmm. Sam's point, if you go out and you get, you know, a profession, you have a trade, you have something, and you have a community then, that now that now that community now has teachers, educators, you know, lawyers, bankers, doctors, you know, um, tradesmen that all work within those fields that can then can build up that community that then can also feed that community and live within the community and off the community and have something so that now the next generation can come up and have it on. And I think that goes to the point that we were talking about when you when we refer to how things were during segregation, you had to rely on your brother and your sister. You had to because there was no other place for you to shop. But you know, once those choices became available, you know, individuals wanted to feel as though they would be respected by doing X, Y, and Z. And granted, I, I, I'll be the first one to tell you, like, you know, it's very much powerful because I think when you get into a certain point, um, when you get into a certain point in life, I think, you know what I'm saying? You just kind of feel like there's certain things that you're supposed to do just because that's what you always thought, you know, it looked like, right? Like you, you think when you get money, you're supposed to move to a nice neighborhood. Like you're supposed to have a, 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 you know what I mean? A big home or whatever, whatever. Like that's just what, you know, perception is. So I think a lot of that time, like us redefining what that is, what that means is something that's going to have to happen. And that can be part of that, you know, coming up with that code of, uh, code of conduct. Lee, I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to talk about real fast on this, but um, uh, with the crabs in a barrel mentality, I would say uh, I kind of want to echo what Dr. Claude Anderson was saying, like the integration that really harmed the community because before it was tight knit, it was more together, and then once you integrate and separate uh, a lot of the people, it's just it really damaged the community, and also um, we'll talk more about reparations as well later. But I think people are just trying to survive. Um, you know, they're used to being, you know, at the bottom. So they're just trying to climb their way up on the top. And that 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 goes to show uh, why we need communities, right? That would help eliminate some of the problem with the crap and barrel mentality by having a code of conduct, having an independent economic structure that you can lean on and having that political representation to fight for you specifically as a group of people. So currently it's it's disjointed, it's it's kind of all over the place and it's not um, uh, more of a structure. So it, that, that's part of the problem um, that we have. And that's my, uh, my thoughts on the crap and the barrel mentality. I know that we have um, an article that we're uh, gonna get into. Um, it, it's by Vice President Kamala Harris and how they're going to uh, administer billions of dollars for my black and minority businesses. So um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, I think this is pulled up on the screen here. Um, so basically uh, the federal government here is going to administer, I believe, uh, what was that number? Uh, almost $9 billion in federal funding to different uh, uh financial institutions to administer it to black and minority and underserved communities. Um, this is their way of trying to help the black community. Business um, owners, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, businesses? Yeah, yeah, yeah business owners, yeah, yeah, business yeah, business yeah, yeah to help. Yeah, it's yeah, to, yeah, help underserved businesses. Sorry, excuse me, I said communities. Sorry about that. And. Um, I find it very interesting because they show the stats. They show how, like, you know, the the negatives of Blacks, like the access to capital issue, um, you know, some of the racism that goes on, um, the unemployment, uh, how hard it is for Blacks to get loans, all of that good, all that bad stuff, right? But when I looked at it, I was like, okay, that's good that they're doing this um, and all of that, but my main concern is that when you're saying black minority and undeserved communities that ends up being every that ends up being almost everybody uh, possibly depending on the language that they're using to 
for people to for businesses to qualify for the funds, um, that can include almost everybody. So that that's what I was talking about earlier with the inclusion when federal government actually administers funds for black people, it's always include too many in, included, right? But when it's other groups, blacks are always excluded. So that that's the thing. I just wanted to be fair. I want us to exclude just like everybody else excludes. Why do we have to include everybody? Because they don't include us in their um, funding and benefits that they receive from the government. So that 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 is my main issue with it. Um, other than that, it's fine, um, and and that's a good thing. I'm sure it's going to help a lot of black businesses, but obviously it would be able to be more beneficial to the black community and black businesses if it, it, if it just included black people, period. I know that would be very controversial, which I don't know why it would be for the federal government to assist the group that's having the most trouble with access to capital, experiencing the most uh, racism when it comes to the banks lending out loans and things of that nature. But I mean, that's the way the country sees us sometimes. That's where the racism truly kicks in where, you know, they see us at, at the bottom and, you know, they're not trying to assist us on the matter. That's why we have to come together and try to create our own communities the best way we can and get that political representation to fight for us better on these issues so we can get that exclusivity of funds. So th those are my thoughts. Y'all guys have any thoughts on the article? Yeah, no, I'm going to jump in that real fast because I, I totally agree with you. I think one of the biggest things is in the wool over the, uh, over the sheep's head, or I guess, if you will, um, is that the fact that what they're going to do is, you know, show these statistics, say like, hey, we're going to address it to these individuals. But like you said, minority can just be, you know, white female. You know what I'm saying? Minority can be, you feel what I'm saying? Anything from like you just said, like, you know, to any black or brown community, it can, it can consist of a lot of different individuals. So when you talk about some of the redress in, in which, you know, this country has done, and we've talked about this in the past, when we've seen, you know, um, dang there, we just saw our currently our current government looking to offer what was it, like three, four hundred thousand to uh immigrants from Afghanistan to come to the United States. Um, so we've seen our country address, you know, um, and, and again, now, and those are harms that were caused, uh, you know, on their land, um, as well as yeah, it was it was billions for Afghans, though, by the way, yeah, right, right, in total. Yeah. But I, I was saying like each citizen was gonna get something like around. You know, three. Yeah, they were gonna get a lot. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So my thing, my thought process with that is again, like you're looking to address things from other, from other countries when there's still stuff that's been going on in this country that hasn't been addressed. There's still citizens in this country who still um, have not received the proper type of education, have not received the proper type of funding to have a a, a decent lifestyle, and yet you know, um, we look at the way other other communities have been able to get access to those. Um, excuse me to those types of uh, funding and things. So I think when we see, you know, funds get spread like that and they say minority and this, that, and the third, if it's not directed, like you said, solely to the black community, we're not going no more. Like that That does not, it mean it absolutely means nothing because it now gets split between so many different gr groups of individuals. You know what I'm saying? And then again, one thing that we also have to add, while this is very nice and we do understand that businesses help, help make the country thrive, help make the country move forward. It helps the country to um to um to to, to to progress. But we do understand that everybody is not business owners. As much as this year we've had so many, you know, we all know we we all know a business owner, right? Like everybody got either you know a store, a business, something online, whether they're doing whatever it is, kind of talk, like whatever, you know, everybody got a business per se. But at the same time, there's still a lot of individuals who don't. You know, whether they just know how to sell an LLC, don't know how to form one, whether they don't necessarily um, know how to, or what to do, what to create, things of that nature. So, or they don't, don't want that. one. I'm sorry? Or they don't want one. Right. Or they don't. They just want to have a job and, you know, work life and, you know, go nine to five, handle their business, get their check, and go on about their day. Um, so... You know, I think when we when we consider that, like that's still a, a, a good group of individuals who aren't getting anything and you're not addressing anything towards them by just saying, but but just saying that, hey, well, we invested in your community per se. You know, um, 
and, and a lot of times, like you said, that might not even be the, the face or the representation of those individuals, you know? Right. So I think those are things that you have to like look at when you look at um, um, the way that this world is structured and the way that things and bills do get structured so that you can see that, you know, again, to, the, to, to Mr. Anderson's point, that you're getting legislation that is specifically meant to represent you. Because right now they're giving these statistics that show like, oh, well, you're supposed to benefit from it. You know, this, this should help y'all, but it's not directly towards you. You know what I mean? And I'm like, let's cut, let's cut that. Give us ours point blank or like stop with all of the extra. Like we not, it's not yeah. going on. Yeah, so like, uh, I agree. Um... I'm not saying don't do these pro programs that help benefit minorities because minorities should receive benefits um, to right the wrongs of the past from things that have taken place in this country because black, black folks are not the only people that were wronged in this country throughout history. However, <laughs> black folks deserve something. We built this country, you know, um, we are the superpower of the world. Um, and it was all built on the backs of black people who are still continuously um, placed and forced to remain at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, and so it, it wouldn't hurt to, to have something to help right those wrongs. Um, there was once upon a time, the affirmative action program, which would help with education, jobs, filling status quo and all that, that's all fine and good. But at the end of the day, what our country functions on is money. And if no access to money is available, right, or the proper education on how to get access to money is available, we're just going to continue to go in this cycle. And that's kind of how we got here, right? Um, we've been here for hundreds of years. And then when somebody figures out the formula, and then they and they start to break that, and they start to put other people on, and it starts to grow, grow, grow our people, somebody comes along and is like, eh, I don't like the fact that you're doing that. So we're going to dead that. And then next thing you know, here we are right back at square one, struggling, crabs in a barrel, trying to pull each other down. Um, sometimes we're trying to lift people up, but it's not the same. We don't have that tight knit um, relationship with each other to try to pour into our community. We don't have those three pillars of community that are required in order for us to thrive and flourish. Um, and so that's why I think what Malik is talking about is government involvement and, and making black people its own protected class. It doesn't mean that race is not a protected class because it absolutely should be. Case in point, look at that Cuban American man um, who just got 110 years for that vehicular homicide accident as a truck driver it was an accident. But you had somebody else a few years earlier who had uh, a vehicular homicide accident, more people died and you only got four years. Like, you know, it's just not it ain't given what it's supposed to give. You know what I'm saying? It's just not even, it's not equal and the hands of justice are supposed to be even and equal. Um, and we all know in this country, it is not that way. Um, just cause you see three black lawyers up here, you know, side note, there's a lot of black folks out here that think that because black people are lawyers that they work for the man or we are them. <laughs> Oh, you know what I'm saying? We are those people, but look, let me just be clear. We went to law school because we saw something that we wanted to change in the community. It doesn't necessarily have to be that it was in a criminal area. It could be in business. It could be in tax. It could be in real estate. There's all these different areas of law. And a lot of times when you see black folks who are lawyers, we're here because we, we know that a change needs to be made. And rather than sitting around and just not doing anything about it, we tried to find a way to be the change that we want to see. Influence our, our, our community, right? Our brothers and sisters, and, and remind them that A, you are protected because you have somebody that looks like you standing right here in this seat. And number two, understand that if you don't know the answer, I can find it out for you because I have a little bit more to give than you than you might, whether it be information or whatever. Um, and and what you said just now, what you said just now, Sam, is uh, it really shows like how uh, the media has been portraying us and promoting us in a negative light. Like you know, that's that's some of the reasons why people have that view of us. 
and then you get some of the juries, as you were mentioning, that will convict these people or even these judges that will give the harshest of sentencing, all due to the media uh, propaganda, right? Because even if you're not thinking about it consciously, it might be subconsciously in the back of your mind because you've been programmed like black people are bad, evil, you know, they're, you know, no second chance with them. You got to give them harsh punishments. So that that, that kind of leads to that point. Uh, what were you going to say, E? Oh, um, no, I, I, yeah, I cut you off. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. Um, I was just saying to, to, to the point that Sam was just making that, you know, um, not only do we have to kind of keep our focus in regards to watching how things play out um, within our community and, and how um, we're being treated. We also have to look at like to, to the point she was making to or excuse me, I think it was you just, just said about the imagery and how we're, how we're being viewed um, because that that's major, you know what I mean? And, and, and it shows because of, you know, your representation within the courts, it also shows within the way that the country and society treats you because it's almost like, if, you know, the country doesn't have rights for you, then why should we, right? And then, and to the point that Sam made too, I think that this is an issue that most people need to look at in society in general as a whole, because to that point, you know, that young man just, just about to get real, that's trying to get railroad, as we would say. Um, and that sucks in comparison to, like we said, I think it was just a, another case where it was a young man who, you know, killed some people, fled the country, came back and got 10 years probation. Whereas this mm-hmm. man tried to get him 120 years, 110 years for some breaks or him driving a truck or it likely, you know what I'm saying? The company probably should have figured it out. I'm sure, I don't know if he was a truck owner or operator, but you know what I'm saying? There probably was definitely some more checks and balances that should have occurred into that place prior to that happening. But at the same time, because he is who he is, and maybe because of his complex reflection, or, or excuse me, complexion rather, he is going to receive, he's receiving the type of- um, A life sentence. Criticism, yeah, criticisms that he's receiving right now. And I think that that goes to the point that people need to realize until we as a people, as I'm, when I'm referring to we, I mean like black people in this country are addressed and, and receive the type of just compensation that is due. Like you're going to continuously see this country shit on other individuals because if they don't take care of the, you know what I'm saying, the ones who made it, what makes you think they're going to take care of other, other people who just, who happen to just be here? If you don't have that complexion, you're not the one. They're not going to give you no justice. So it's like, you got to figure that out on your own. Like, dang, do I got to just make it? And again, don't matter who you are, because at the same time, um, as we've seen, you can still, you still can catch it. White, brown, gay, whatever, you still can catch it. Um, And so like, at the end of the day, I think we have to realize that we need to address all harms. It's, It's starting within my community, you feel me? So that we can continue to make sure that we treat everyone as equal, that we treat all people like one. And until that day comes, we're going to continuously see people do that. And I think other communities need to be aware because first it started with, like we said, with the Blacks, community is with, uh, screw that. No, yeah, no. It started with Blacks. Then it used to be going over to, like you said, like the Irish, Italians. Well, then first it, it started with women and, and and then Blacks and then Irish and then Asian. Okay, okay. Like, All right. I'll, give you, I'll give you some of that. Yeah, I'll give you that. All right. You know what I'm saying? And then, okay, right, sure. Boom, 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 boom. Then all of those. Then he went to like you said. Uh, then he went to like uh, Middle Eastern. Then he went to like Latin, um, like you know Mexicans and, and on like the okay. border issue. Like so, it's it comes and it's gonna come to everybody if you're not if we're not diligent. And I think that's why it's important that you know what I'm saying. Each individual or that we that we all fight to make sure that each community, not all of us fight, but our fight within the black community is to make sure that our community gets the address to a harm that we received and then after that you know hopefully we can see that other communities receive that same thing yeah so um just to finish up what i was saying like as far as government um involvement is is concerned and why it's necessary is because throughout history everything the black people have gotten the government had to get involved um everything even even when we we marched and protested and boycotted and all that other kind of stuff those things needed to happen in order to move the government to force 
those who were creating the problems to stop creating the problems. So government involvement is absolutely necessary. Um, and so when we're talking about these kinds of things and, and building a community, you know, there are solutions, there are potential solutions. And in, in building a community, we have to start with those three pillars, having an economic structure, a code of conduct, and elected officials, right? And some of the ways that we start, um, especially, especially as it relates to um, the economic structure is reparations. We talk about rep reparations all the time. We even had a whole episode on it last week. You know, people are often repaired based on the injustices that have been committed against them and their people in this country. Everybody except Black folks. Everybody except Black folks. And so, you know, if you start there within the community, you know, it's it's like Malik and I were talking about this a couple, uh, couple of days ago, yesterday or something, and, and we were saying, you know, it's almost like, you know, we go through group trauma as Black folks, right? And that's when you see us unify as we are dealing with the group trauma. But you don't often see group positive stuff that brings us together. And that's what we need. We need something that's going to bring us together in a positive way. Um, which includes legislation, which includes reparations, which includes education, right? Because uh, he touched on it earlier with the Black Panther Party. When you saw the Black Panther Party, yes, they were considered to be the Black Panther Party of self-defense. The purpose of the group was to create self-defense and protect their communities, their communities, not just their neighborhoods, but their communities. Because at that point in time, these places were trying to thrive and you had racist white police officers coming into those areas and brutalizing people for literally just living their lives. So what did they do? There was propaganda that was out there about being a black monkey, being dirty, being ugly and all that. And, and how you have to press your hair and how you got to do all this and that. But what the Black Panther Party started to remind black folks is that we are beautiful. My black is beautiful, right? And they started by teaching the children that. And it's important because when you teach the children that, when it starts with the children, we talked about the Willie Lynch letter and how when you want to build a slave, you want to start with the mother, right? Because if you break the mother, she's going to break the children and it's going to go on generationally. Well, you undo that by using that same formula. And you use that formula by growing and speaking positive love, light, and, and abundance into these children so that those things begin to grow and flourish so that they can pour into their community. And then that, that way the community can pour back out to them. Um, and so I think a lot of that has a lot to do with education and promotion of positive imagery and a lot of other things, you know what I'm saying? And so I did want to just go ahead and touch on some of those things as far as solutions go. You guys are more than welcome to go ahead and, you know, add whatever it is that you think, but I did want to make sure I touched on those things. No, I agree with you. I think, you know, legislation that's directly to the Black community is definitely something that can help. I know one of the things we talked about, again, like in our previous episodes, whether it be a solution of um, um, a multitude of answers, whether that be, you know, taxes, you know what I'm saying? Whether, you know, maybe lifting taxes for certain individuals, whether it's, you know, uh, lifting student loans for other individuals, whether it's, you know, providing housing credits for other individuals, whether it's providing educational credits for other, you know, um, but something that allows people to kind of catch up and be in a position where everyone isn't necessarily sitting back and we looking at it like, oh, well, why is it that all of these groups of people are just like deemed to be like that, where it just looked like, no, it's just by life. Like they just happen to all be in this messed up situation. No, ain't no way in hell. You're gonna try to convince me that all over the world or excuse me, all over the nation rather, that all of these individuals are in this same situation just because like, you know what I'm saying? Like just because they all just happen to just be as they would like to say, lazy or um whatever uneducated or you know what i'm saying like no there's factors that play into that and i think until we address those factors to allow individuals in this country to have that access then we're going to have the type of issues that we're having and i think you know we see this social unrest running into a lot of things like you look in the current days with the schools you see a lot of the school districts having shut down recently and i'm not saying that that's a black issue but i think it's more of an issue of the instability within the country and I think, you know, if there were, you know, people treating people fairly, people treating people with respect, people treating people with, uh, and acknowledging when they do wrong, instead of trying to do these things where we're just going to not, you know, label who did what 
we're going to call people workers instead of, you know what I'm saying, slaves and what it was and try to, you know, critically race your way into feeling better about yourself as opposed to, you know, really just doing the shadow work, as we say, in addressing the issues, then you're going to have what we're seeing. You're going to have a lot of confused people. You're going to have people just, just hurting people just because they're hurt. You're going to have people who have, you know, what we would consider to be uh, whatever, the American dream or, you know, good background, good education, good family, but then do crazy things. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, well, where did that come from? You feel me? But I think that counts from the fact that people don't want to address the fact that we have to look at our past in order to answer the future. And so I want to also... Um, go take this time to go into our motivational minute unless you guys have something else y'all want to talk on uh i just wanted to add uh one thing on the solutions part i think you know uh black people having a personal accountability and taking up upon themselves and um just trying to you know solve some of the problems right like hey you know we gotta build our own own communities we can't just leave and plead them we need to take it upon ourselves to fix them because uh, you know time has proven to us that we can't rely on just the government or somebody to come in and fix it we have to start the work on ourselves of course we need help and assistance and demand it and do the things that we can politically um, through representatives and through voting or other valid measures in order to achieve our goal of having a prosperous community because right now we just have neighborhoods like Dr. Claude Anderson said where we just live so that's all I wanted to say. Okay guys and so now I'm going to go into um, our motivational minute. The reason most people fail is because they give up what they want most for what they want now. Mm. The reason most people fail is because they give up what they want most for what they want now. If that was one message, it'd probably be that. Like, people don't fail because they're not talented or skilled or whatever. It's like you give up what you want most for what you want now. The reason most people fail is because they give up what they want most for what they want now. Let me start this video. Okay. So, yeah, um, that was a quote uh, that I seen on Instagram, and, I, and I, it was just real powerful. Because I think a lot of times we we see that, like we talked about, you know, an individual who's able to um, acquire a certain level of success in this world, you know, they have what they want now, right? Like they were able to get to, you know, a bag. They were able to get to that house. They were able to get to that neighborhood. They was able to get to that car, that whatever it is that they wanted. You know what I mean? And, and that might be their, you know, they might make sacrifices to get to that point. You feel me? But there's a lot of individuals who who give up before they even, you know, get to whatever it is that they want, right? So there's some people who maybe want that house, that car, that whatever, you know, want that dream, that education, that degree, whatever, but they might give in to, you know, oh, well, I'm tired. I don't want to stay up late. I don't want to do more. I don't, you know, um, case and example, and what we were talking about right now, um, I don't want to go out and vote. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it, I, it's more convenient for me to just sit back and chill. I don't, I don't want to run for an office. Let's screw just voting because, you know, in order for you to vote, you got to vote for someone, right? But I don't want to run for office, maybe even, you know what I'm saying? Because I feel like there's things that I need to be doing and it's not going to be beneficial, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, so there's things that we all, is that not we all, but there's something, there's things that people give up on a daily that can prevent them from getting what they truly want out of life. And I think a lot of times we as a community are doing that. We're doing that because we see maybe for a few basketball players, for a few entertainers, for a few, um, for a few likes and things of that nature, you see people giving up a lot. You know what I'm saying? Their self-respect. We see people giving up the sense of community for it. We see people give up a lot of things um, for their success right now as opposed to the success of the whole or as opposed to the success of the collective. So for me, that's something that I wanted to play so that you kind of can just like keep in mind that if you do make a decision on your day-to-day -day basis, when you make that decision, ask yourself, is this something, is this going, something that's going to cost me in the long run? Am I giving up my, my bigger dream just to achieve this one little thing right now, you know, just to have this one little piece? Like, does it mean enough for me to try to prevent me from getting even more than what I may, may have wanted for? 
in my life. So yeah, that was just something that I wanted to do just, you know, to remind people, you know, don't, don't, you know, take short term success over long term. You know what I'm saying? Run your race, run your race the full way. Don't, don't, don't stop at the one heat. You know what I'm saying? Don't stop at the one lap, you know, continue to run your race because, you know, um, you can get it all. You know what I'm saying? It just, you're going to have to sacrifice all on your way to getting it all. You know what I'm saying? But you'll get it all back. You feel me? And whatever you don't, you don't get what you need. You always have, you always will. So that's just my little motivational speech for the minute. I also want to real quickly reference the Black Business of the Week, which was uh, Black Men's Wear. Um, again, it's an organization that's dedicated to just providing um, positive imagery of Black men in this society. Um, again, is welcome to all ages, all young, you know, young, old, you know, um, great opportunity for guys to get out and network, meet people in different communities um, within this nation who are like-minded and who have a call of action to want to make sure that, you know, the imagery of the Black male is perceived in the way that they want us to, I mean, excuse me, in the way that we would like to be perceived and not necessarily the one that the society or the media has portrayed us. What's the name of it again? Uh, Black Men's Wear, Black Men's Wear um, is the name of the company. And again, their website is a link tree to uh, blackmenswear.com. So you guys can check them out or you can follow them on Instagram. Uh, again, that's Black Men's Wear on Instagram. And you can find out where their next events are. Uh, my understanding is that they offer these events uh, monthly. So, you know, you can see where they're going to have something maybe in your region or if it's a region or an area that you would like to travel to. You know, you're more than welcome to do that. But um, this is my first time experiencing it this past weekend. Um, look forward to posting some pictures for you guys soon so you guys can check that out. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a real good was a real good feeling just to kind of see guys just come together and and um, unite under the goal of making sure that, you know, when people see hundreds, if not thousands, you know, because I think you said there's over like 3,000 throughout the year that um, has reached out and, and worked with them. But, you know, you can go to their site and see images of the images of the brothers wearing all different color suits, all different types of things. And I think next year they're looking to take it to Africa too. So um, there will be a lot more uh, opportunities for people to do more international traveling and, and connecting as well. Well, that's good. Um, well, my final thoughts are, um, I think uh, we, we definitely need communities. Um, not neighborhoods um, because we don't have them. We used to, as we discussed earlier, um, I totally agree with what Dr. Clyde Henderson was saying. And I think we need to work on those things, building an independent structure, creating a code of conduct and um, having better political representation. It's not like we don't have some of those things, but we need to do better in those areas. Um, so I think that's, that's the way to go. Um, so I agree, and I'm trying to do everything I can to do my part, because it takes a village, so. Absolutely, it does take a village. Um, um, I, I echo with, with what Malik and Everett said. Um, doc, Dr. Claude Anderson made a very good point, and I think that it's important for us as, as a people to recognize that if we intend to grow a community, there's a way to go about doing it. And pulling people down and not helping each other up is not not it. That ain't gonna do it. That ain't gonna get us there at all. We're gonna continue in this ugly, stupid, vicious, vicious cycle, and it's a stupid cycle. Just to just to be clear, um, as long as we continue to go about doing things the same way, you're never gonna get something different when you um, continue to operate um, the same way. So you know that's the definition of insanity: doing the same thing, expecting a different result. And we don't need to be keep doing that because it doesn't make any sense. Um, so again, you know, continue to work together, um, try to find ways to build each other up um, and just be good to one another. You know, that's one of the things that we often say. Um, and so, you know, we did want to also make sure we let you know, um, happy holidays, right? Because Christmas is at the end of the week. We got Kwanzaa popping. We got Hanukkah, if you uh, are Jewish, I think that just passed. We also got um, New Year's coming. So we wanted to go ahead and wish you guys all a, a happy holiday, or well, happy holidays. Let you all know we are not gonna have a show next week. We are taking off for the, for the holidays. 
And that when we come back next year, we got some things for you. So you're gonna see a lot of changes with us. Um, we have been doing a lot of things behind the scenes, trying to make sure we bring you guys the best content that we can possibly give you. So we wanna, for the, from the bottom of our hearts, thank each and every one of you for tapping in with us every week or whenever it is that you do get a chance to tap in, however often that you are able to tap in, whether it's just on Wednesdays, whether it's on Sundays or Saturdays, whenever we were having it, um, or if it's every single time we drop or if you check us out on our social media pages or on YouTube. We do appreciate it. We wanna make sure we tell you all, we love y'all for that. And we thank y'all so much for y'all's love and support and encouragement too. Um, please make sure you check us out on our social media platforms right here on Facebook. We have our Counterpoise podcast. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, um, tell a friend to tell a friend, all that good stuff. Same thing with on Instagram. Um, Instagram, Please make sure you tap into that. That's also Town of Poets podcast. And we are there every Wednesday. Um, again, we're taking, there's no show next week at all. Um, and so there's not gonna be a What's Up Wednesday. There's not gonna be um, Sunday either because we are taking for time for vacation, spend time with our families and stuff. Um, but we are here for What's Up Wednesday, pretty much every Wednesday at 8.30 um, p.m. On, on Instagram Live. Come right here on Sunday around noon. Um, on Facebook, Counterpoise Podcast on both. Now go check out all of our episodes that are on IGTV for What's Up Wednesday and for uh, and on YouTube for um, our Sunday podcast. That is Counterpoise Podcast. Tell a friend, tell a friend. We love y'all. We thank y'all. You want to catch me? If you want to go ahead and follow me by myself, you can follow me right here on Facebook at Samantha Adams hyphen ESQ or over there on Instagram at Samantha Renee 77 underscore ESQ. Fellas are going to drop their socials. But again, thank you guys so, so much for all the love and support for our first year of, um, of this Counterpoise podcast. We really love and appreciate, appreciate y'all. Fellas. Uh, yeah, uh, you guys can catch me at Malik M. Foster on all social media handles. Uh, once again, you can catch me at Malik M. Foster on all social media handles. And also, I want to say that, you know, thank you guys for the love and support for the first year and happy holidays, to everybody. Uh, I know we're going to be out for a week, but we'll be back after that. And we're going to hit the ground running for next year. So thank you. And ever you got anything else? Yeah, you guys uh, definitely want to appreciate everybody from tapping in with us this year. Um, to echo Sam's point, we definitely have some more changes looking to come forward for y'all this next upcoming year. Um, bring you guys some more content, more perspectives, more, more, more everything. Um, so please stick with us. Uh, we got more coming for y'all. We just gonna get better. That's all we do in life is just go harder and get better and get stronger. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Iron. So you know, we 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 tapped in and looking to find ways to. Um, as we continue to grow in our own lives, personal lives, um, career-wise, and everything else to grow our show as well and, and to let you guys get more and more content, keep you guys abreast to the things that's going on in society so that you can say, you know, hey, somebody somebody told you. You know what I mean? Whether you, you tapped in and heard it or not, someone told you, right? So um, you can catch me on that guy, 2104, um, on Instagram, really. I mean, that's all the social I have right now. Um, so yeah, you can catch me there. Um, if you know my number, hit my line. <laughs> but was, uh, other than that, yeah. Uh, thank you guys for tapping in with us. Thank y'all for just you know following through. Um, thank y'all for partially being part of my therapy. Thank y'all for uh, you know what I'm saying. And my co-host, thank y'all for the commitment that you all have made this year as well. Because um, you know this is a, a journey for all of us and a learning experience. So I appreciate y'all all for y'all commitments as well. Impatience, because we've definitely <laughs> have had to grow. You know what I'm saying? Um, one of the other things is, so we're starting off next year, like Malik said, hitting the ground running. And uh, if you guys have any ideas, topics you want to hear us talk about, please don't don't hesitate to let us know. We read your comments. We read messages. We read DMs. We check all that stuff out. Um, so please, we, we, love, we love when you guys interact with us. So if you guys have any ideas, please feel free to DM us, email us, whatever you guys want to do. Um, but either way, again, thank you so much. Happy holidays. And we out. Peace. Peace.